listening to the We Are West Ham podcast and this is the Opposition View with me, Will Pugh, ahead of Thursday's game at Tottenham Hotspur. Usually the biggest game we look for in the calendar, but now we're European champions and seasoned European campaigners. Those days of only caring about what happened in the games against Tottenham in the season are long behind us, but still a huge one. Nonetheless, I'm delighted to say joining me for the first time ever, joining us for the first time ever on the We Are West Ham podcast is big uh, sports journalist sensation at the Sun and Tottenham fan, Dean Scoggins. Dean, great to have you with us on Thank the you. podcast for the first time. It is the first time, I think. I think so, yeah. I, think yeah, so. Yeah, I didn't yeah. want to have uh, forgotten a previously historic appearance. But listen, big game on, on Thursday. We normally go back and forward quite a lot. Uh, and you take the, well, I think you know that the stance you take on West Ham games annoys me. And, Very uh, much so. Yeah, yeah, look, it's just West Ham going, I'm not that bothered, it's only West Ham, you know, I don't care, I only care about Tottenham. You always give that one to me, I just don't believe it because that's not how I feel at all. It's just three points. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, it's just three points. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that does my head in every time you say it. But I, I do understand when you say, you know, you, the reason, we've spoken about this fairly calmly before, but the reason I've always cared so much about how we get on against Spurs is because for most of my life there's been very little else to get hyped up about. Probably yeah. not so much a case for... for well, I, think, I think you summed it up a little bit really well then now that you've had the European trophy, that the sights are then yeah. higher. And, you know, all, I, you know, the Arsenal thing for us was, was always the... As long as we're just looking at them, we're never actually going to achieve anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now that, you know, when we went through the Pochettino era and it became the sights became higher than just catching Arsenal, it's then quite a nice place to be. Look, of course I care about the game, and of yeah. course I care about beating West Ham, um, and, but I only care about West Ham when they're playing West Ham, if yeah. that makes sense. But yeah, three points, um, but I really, really get nervous before West Ham games, probably more so than any other London derby games, because you never quite know what Tottenham you're going to get and what <laughs> West Ham you're going to get. So uh, yeah. it's always pretty comfortable to know which Arsenal or Chelsea you're going to get against Tottenham. Because they'll, yeah, be, yeah, yeah, they'll yeah, be good. Yeah. But you don't really know what West Ham you're going to get. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, it's a funny one for me, because I watched, I went to the Friendly in Australia in the summer, West Ham Spurs. And even then, I mean, it couldn't have mattered less but even then, us winning. Now, I think Harry Kane's last ever game in a Tottenham shirt, that was, I think. No, he played in the pre-season game. He played yeah. at home yeah, against Shakhtar Donetsk. Ah, oh, so, right. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah, penultimate game yeah. then. And uh, even then, it couldn't have mattered less, but I was like, yes, at the end, yeah. we were being friendly. But um, as, I do know what you mean. It has changed a little bit this season because, and it's not just because we won the, the competition last year, but as football fans, right, if you're a Charlton fan or if you're a Chesterfield fan or a Barrow fan, you've got to find something every year to hype up your experience, haven't you? I yeah, mean, just sort absolutely. Of shrug it off. And, uh, and I still, I don't think that will ever leave me the Tottenham thing, but I think it always sort of rankles with West Ham fans. The fact that it's very much the same with our thing with Millwall, really, is the fact that Tottenham don't hate West Ham as much as West Ham hate Tottenham. Absolutely. When yeah. we're reminded of that, it's more annoying. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it was there was a really interesting. Uh, I think I've mentioned this to you before. It was a really interesting one when you were the first team to beat us at the Tottenham Stadium when Antonio scored. What a seven and, minutes, yeah, yeah, it was fantastic, and and he was outstanding. Yeah. And he came off a couple of minutes before the end, and he was walking down the touch touchline, not far from where I was sat, and, and most of us applauded him because he's been so good. That. Yeah, well, we absolutely did, and the West Ham fans just to our right went absolutely crazy. We're like. What? He's been excellent. <laughs> He's scored a great goal. Like, you know, and I mean, it, that had a lot to do with also, I should say, with how abject Spurs were. Mm. So it was almost like, look, we've even been done by Antonio, sort of thing. So it was, it was, there was a bit of that in there. But, but yeah, look, that that trophy that you got for uh, being the first team to beat us at the Tottenham <laughs> Stadium still stands, doesn't it? So. Yeah, quite. I think what what. I think you are somewhat of a different breed of Tottenham fan, I think, in that what I think always makes me laugh is that most Tottenham fans profess to not care and they give it the old, oh yeah, 1-0 in your cup final and all that sort of stuff when we're in the ground. But last time I went to, to Spurs, I can't remember what game it was. It might have been the League Cup, I think, and kind of last season, season before, Jared Bowen puts 1-0 up and you went on to win. And the entire stadium 
in the bowels of this supersonic best stadium there's ever been or ever will be was full of tens of thousands of Tottenham fans rejoicing, singing West Ham get battered everywhere they go. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's weird because like, you seem to care quite yeah, a lot. It's now. all pantomime though, isn't it? It's all Not pantomime. for all Tottenham fans. Yeah. You are different, I will give you yeah. that. And as long as you're still behind us, then it's, <laughs> it's absolutely pantomime for the whole way through. But no, look, I, I, I absolutely care when, when it's going on. My, my, yeah, I am different to a lot of Spurs fans in that respect, I, I think, because I, I abs if, if Tottenham had beaten Man City this weekend, I wouldn't have even looked at Arsenal's result yeah. or West Ham's result. Yeah. That, that's the way I look at it. And if we get to the end of the season and, and you get a draw and you're needing, po you know, needing other rivals to drop points, then it matters more what they're doing. But, yeah, I mean, I love derbies. I love going to those, the games. I can't wait for Thursday. Um, and, but because of the occasion of it being a derby, not because it's particularly against one club or another. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I talk to you about the West Ham Tottenham rivalry, it always makes me feel quite childish. <laughs> <laughs> Good, I'm pleased with that. Because <laughs> your, uh, your sort of stance on it makes, then when I, I've obviously watched some Spurs and West Ham games with you before, but particularly Spurs games, when I'm just, even though it doesn't affect West Ham at all, just cheering when the opponent score against Tottenham, <laughs> I just sort of, it has forced me to look at myself a little bit, but I still can't change it. And I, and I think you were quite annoyed when I was pleased that West Ham won the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm like, I don't want that. I don't want you to be pleased with me. Yeah, we've well, got the, the Spurs Liverpool Champions League final, was like Hobson's choice. I was just like, well, I don't, yeah. if this game can go on forever. Yeah. being a nil nil and they just postpone it. Absolutely, yeah. I, can <laughs> see, I can see that. I think I absolutely see that. If that was two rival English clubs and Tottenham were part of it, I'm not sure I would have watched it yeah. unless I had to work for, for that uh, occasion. Yeah, but, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. Listen, um, Spurs fifth, haven't won for four games. Uh, two red cards in your last seven, massive disciplinary issue obviously going on. Conceded 11 in four games, absolute disaster. Worrying times in North London, isn't it? it it's incredible that it's not. <laughs> and, and that just about sums up the, the Ange impact so far. I, I don't remember in 30 years now of going to watch Spurs, and obviously the early early years I don't really remember much other than we were just completely rubbish, yeah. but, but I don't ever remember there being a feel-good factor quite like this. And as I say, don't get me wrong, I am quite a, an, an odd fan in the respect that I just I love going to games and I, and I love the experience of it all. And, and yeah, I, I want to win and I want to win the Derby games, but it matters to me that we've had a good time and we've played well and we've done it in the right way. And so far, the fit couldn't be better. He, he's incredible. And yeah, yeah, look, haven't won in four, three defeats, but a great result against City. And I think... The, the, the difference is is that we battered Chelsea and lost and the disciplinary thing came into it there for sure. We were very, very poor at Wolves where it was almost like a hangover from, from that game. Yeah. We then battered Villa and lost and how we lost that game, I'm not quite sure. And then we were incredibly lucky against Man City, let's not shy away from that. But the attitude shown from some of those players is just a different class. So, so yeah, it's, it feels like you're in a slump when you're... Uh, it feels like you're not in a slump when you are in a slump. So it'll be very interesting to see how they react from, from the weekend's game against City on Thursday. Well, you, you talk about that. We'll go into Andrew in a minute. And I think that's what's so interesting about football fanhood generally is that if you'd have lost that game where, look, let's be honest, I know... We'll, we'll talk about Ange's approach and that's obviously got its rewards. It has its risks with it, but he'll say, well, yeah, it wasn't just a fluke. I know yeah, we might have got a bit fortunate, but Erling Haaland, if he puts his chance in earlier in the game, you sense it may have been a different game. Not that you wouldn't have come back, but, and it might have been... Oh, I think it would have been 7-2 yeah, or something like well, that. Exactly. But, yeah, exactly. But it might have been Spurs' pressure that forced City into those mistakes anyway. I, yeah. I totally understand that. But... If, for, if that game had gone the way most people thought it was going to and City had won, plus West Ham had held on against the might of free-scoring, not Crystal Palace at home, we'd have been three points behind you going into Thursday's game. Mm. And which, I know we're not now, but fine margins mean yeah. we could have been. Absolutely. And the difference in fan feeling between those two clubs, if you take away... The, the, the attitude towards Moyes among our fan base, the attitude towards Ange and yours, 
if you just look at that objectively and go after 14, 15 games, yeah. that going into West Ham Tottenham, West Ham could go level on points with Spurs, you'd think, if you said it team, been a great start to team A and yeah. Team B, one set of fans is delighted, one set of fans is really disgruntled, wants a manager out, most people would have gone, oh, it must be Tottenham yeah, yeah. then. But it's not like that at all. What, talk to me a little bit about Ange, and, because there are those cynics, or not cynics, there are lots of people just suggesting, as much as he's a good football manager, he's also a great like, PR um, yeah, yeah. There's, 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 absolute, the top yeah, there's, abs there's absolutely that part of it. And when when the the list of managerial candidates was was there in the summer, and you know, in the jobs that we do, we can sit there and and, and pontificate over over which is going to be the best for which. And and I genuinely wanted Vincent Company or Ange Postecoglou. Yeah. And and as that was as much for their football philosophy yeah, to yeah, use yeah. that phrase as as you put it. The, the way they carry themselves and their demeanour and the, the way that they project their football club because we've had Antonio Conte who is a footballing genius by lots of counts but from a PR perspective is just a grenade just waiting for someone yeah, to pull yeah. the pin yeah. then we had Jose Mourinho who needs no further introduction before that and Nuno Espirito Santo who yeah. put half of the journalists packed to sleep in a press conference so to have all of a sudden this guy who just talks in a way that makes you want to watch him, let alone the football that he plays, yeah. is a big shift. And you can see how that then would translate to the players. The number of team meetings that these players have, mm -hmm. the number of tactical sessions that they've got to sit through, the number of videos and the analysis that they have to go through on opposition. You know, most of the teams played Saturday or Sunday this week, and played Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday this week. They then got another game Saturday or Sunday or Monday night. Then they go into European cycle again. Yeah. And so those sessions are daily. It's like that horrible meeting you've got to have at work every day. And to have then a guy who comes across as the most enthusiastic lover of football who will put his arm around you and tell you you're brilliant, it's got to make a huge difference, yeah, and it yeah. clearly is. And the whole fan base have bought into him. The players have clearly bought into him because with 11 injuries, you'd expect the, the players who've been left out in those first games not to be quite on the same page, and they've just gone and taken a, a point off Man City, albeit with a big stroke of luck. But they've gone in the last 20 minutes and gone, we've not lost this game yet, and we're going to have a good go. Yeah, yeah. And that doesn't happen when all players in the squad are not singing from the same hymn sheet. And, uh, yeah, it's been a remarkable impact. And as you say, it, the last few games have been edgy and shaky and not been, when we, as you say, only three points, could have been only three points ahead of West Ham. But on the flip side, playing the way we could, we, we are, but for a red card in the Chelsea game, the first red card, we could be four points clear. Yeah, yeah. And so, I know, we're, we're not good enough to be top of the table yet, but the general attitude of it has changed. So that's it's a real, real amazing impact. I think that's what is... I mean, I couldn't be... But everyone watching and listening will know what a Moyes advocate I am and how I think he has absolutely been and continues to be the best thing for our football club, given all the, the uh, level of finance and the way the club's run generally. I think David Moyes has punched above West Ham's weight with us since he's been here for his second spell and continues to do that with our league position, top of the Europa League, beat us in the Carabao Cup to get through to the quarters. It could, but what more can the man do, in my opinion? But I do think that's, and I find myself constantly at odds with a, I don't, know, I don't want to say large, but a sizable portion of our fan base and more so, you'll know, it's the more vocal ones on Twitter. Yeah. So people start to think that's how all fans think. I know we're just talking to them at games, but not everyone does. But I think that right there is the difference, that West Ham fans expect and want us to be playing, and would prefer their team to be playing like that. But I think, I don't know what you think, but it feels like at Tottenham, the possibility has got the players that lend it to absolutely, a bit more, absolutely David right. Moyes has not. Absolutely right, and this was and, and this was really, and I, I think you're, you're spot on, he, he's, he's been fantastic, Postacoglu, but he's not a miracle worker, <laughs> and so he's, he's not all of a sudden reinvented football, yeah. and when, when he was looked at as the manager, these are Premier League football clubs, right? They do their due diligence, they have, sit and have a conversation about the playing style that they've got, and thankfully, hallelujah, for kind of the first time in since Pochettino left, certainly, they've made a sensible decision around what they've got playing staff-wise, 
and what the manager wants to do, and then backed him in the summer. Yeah. So he did bring in Van der Ven, he did bring in Madison. You know, we, we've got the likes of Son and Kuliczewski, and yes, we lost Harry Kane, which, you know, can never, never be over how huge that is. But he has got the players to play the way he wants to. And, and I, I, I didn't want to be right about Conte because obviously I wanted us to be good. Yeah, but yeah. but I, I did keep, keep on saying we've got this group of players who kind of like chaos yeah. and Conte wants to play in this rigid, yeah. formulaic way and we didn't have the footballers to play like that. Romero, chaos. You know, Basuma, chaos, loves it. You know, Kuliczewski wants it to go from one end yeah. to the other. Son wants the space in behind, yeah. which is not there if you're then playing in this rigid way. Um, so, yeah, he definitely fits. Um, he's definitely got them to buy into it. But I, I do think that, you know, he, he Postacoglu could not have gone into West Ham and played that way with the playing staff that West Ham have got. No, quite. And, I, and that's what I find. I mean, obviously this is more of a, a top of view. So that, that's what I, I, I definitely think. That. And I just think... Sometimes, and that's what frustrates me really, because I feel like at the moment, this is my favourite time supporting West Ham since I've been alive. In 32 years, I've never enjoyed for such a sustainably and continued period in supporting West Ham as much. We've had flash in the pan seasons, I've got to count on one hand. Pardew was good, Redknapp, I was just starting getting into football, but I know we had a season good under Redknapp. Glenn Road, who had a good year, I think come seventh, still not as good as Moisey. Um, and Slavin Bilic last season at Upton Park. Those flash in the pan seasons, we're in Europe for the third time ever, for the third consecutive time, for the first time ever. Yeah. I, I've never enjoyed it so much, and I, I, it almost, I almost makes me sad <laughs> that I'm like, this should be, we should all be loving yeah. this. Yeah. What do you think, we get, if we get rid of David Moyes, people are going, oh, I want Javi Alonso. He's probably going to run Bayern Munich close in the Bundesliga. And ultimately, and this, I know it's hard to say sometimes, but it's probably a bigger collider yeah, yeah. manager than West Ham. Yeah, but you think, you think that, I think you touched on a very important point there about the PR thing, yeah. and that's what Postacoglu's done so well, is that I, I don't think we, we win the game against Sheffield United when we were 1-0 down going into injury time, and we, we equalised on about the 90th minute and then mm. scored in like the 97th or 98th. I don't think we win that game without the feel-good factor that he's brought. That was yeah, very yeah, early yeah. in the season. We didn't really know what Spurs were going to be at that point. And, but everyone has stayed in the stadium. You know, not, there was no. not a single person had left after 97, 98 minutes because it just felt right. Yeah, yeah. And that PR thing that he'd done. And then we did the same against Liverpool. Mm. You know, where, all right, we were pretty poor against nine men um, for quite long periods and ran out of ideas. But the fans had bought into it, and, yeah. and, the, and the, you know, the stadium was absolutely rocking in the last minute, and we get another last minute winner, and that feel-good factor from that PR really does rub off on fans, and you know all, all the things about songs being written about him, and, yeah. and the bands before the games. I know it's corny, I know it's cheesy, and I know that you know everyone cringy, wants to, yeah, yeah, cringy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> everyone wants to talk about the cheese room in the stadium rather than the bloke playing the band, you know, in the band, but but. That is back at Tottenham, yeah. and that is not to be underestimated. It doesn't make the team any better, but maybe it just gives that extra little 1%, 2%, which at that level just gives you a little edge. And the difference is, right, Tottenham scored last-minute goals at the moment because of the feeling of the fans, and it's oh, look, it's because everyone's behind it and they go right to the last minute. Thomas Suchek gets a few last-minute winners for us recently. It's, oh, we were crap, we shouldn't be relying on last-minute winners from Suchek. We were so rubbish for the majority of the game. And it's the same thing's happened. We've yeah. got the same amount of points as you have. And it's just, uh, I just find it really interesting at the moment. And I think it's hard to change up for a manager. But listen, um, do you think, because the last time we had that at West Ham was with Slavin Bilic, right? And it wasn't sustainable. It was good for the last season up to Park. Payet and Lanzini, and Manuel Lanzini, his um, contribution to that season, it was always like, underrated. Because he was so good, it meant teams couldn't double up and play it. Diafra Sacco, we haven't had a good striker since him as part from Arnautovic, maybe. Uh, but that was sort of the last time West Ham had that sense, what you're talking about yeah. now, where you couldn't wait to get to Upton Park because we were going to watch some outstanding attacking footballers. And Slavin Village was like Ange to an extent, yeah. where it's like, go and express yourself, lads. Let's win first and worry about, worry exactly about losing that. second. Yeah, 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 definitely. And that was all fine. 
moved to the London Stadium, Payet goes, or no, he didn't go straight away to be fair, but he was, his head was gone, um, and it all fell to bits basically, mm. and that, you know, oh, great attacking football, and, that, and David Moyes is some of the antithesis of that, but give me a David Moyes over a I love the last who's up to part of Slavon Village, but give me a David Moyes any day of the week, because it's a, a recipe for sustained success, which I've never had. Do you think with Ange that, because there are people, and you can sense it, can't you, just waiting yeah. for oh, it all to go wrong. Desperate. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, yeah, see, yeah. oh my God, look at the song, remember when yeah. you thought you were good, uh, you ninth again, yeah. Spurs, you, you can We were top under Nuno, and yeah. then that's what happened, yeah. Not just yeah. top I don't know, I don't feel like there's top fans, but other fans oh, they're, they're, oh, and pundits. And, and, and absolutely, fans. Tottenham would seem to have, maybe, maybe this is just me thinking it as a Spurs fan, but woe is me, but but I think there's this general perception that everyone wants to use the Spursy tag and, and yeah, it's like Spurs, wait. Spurs are, the, are, the, are that club that everyone yeah. can't wait to go, oh look, you know, yeah, it's yeah. that kid who's fallen over on the playground again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But do you honestly, uh, do you genuinely think this approach, sort of, so in our experiences with Billich and I found it wasn't, so I'd rather have Moisey, do you think it's a sustainable, not just what, for the rest of the season, what results do you think it produced this season? And then beyond that, do you feel it's a sustainable way to... Well, I, I, was, I was very much on the fence. Um, and it's weird that in losing games, I trust it more, if that, if that makes any sort of sense. Because, well, for, 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 a, well, for a start, when we beat Liverpool, I, I haven't really paid any attention to Liverpool in the early part of the season, yeah, yeah. you know, they had a sort of couple of indifferent results. They had new signings. Yeah, yeah. You didn't really know what they were going to be. When they went down to ten men, they outplayed us. Yeah. And then when they went down to nine, they were absolutely outstanding. <laughs> and I didn't think that Liverpool were title contenders until I saw Spurs beat them. Yeah. yeah. You know, because it was almost like wow. With nine men, they were. I mean, they had a really good chance yeah, with yeah. nine men. You know, they were robbed with the obviously the VAR offside decision. Yeah. And I also. I thought, hang on, Liverpool are, are the real deal. When Spurs then went down to nine against Chelsea, and you know some people will call it mad, others others have a different view with the high line, and they carried on pressing, they carried on going. You know, we could have equalised against Chelsea there and got away with a two-two. It would have been the most remarkable point you've ever seen. All right, it ended up being looking like Jackson's the best striker in the Premier League when he's <laughs> the worst. Quite the worst. Yeah. Um, but and then we played very poorly at Wolves. We can write that one off, but against Aston Villa with nine, yeah. ten injuries, two suspensions, we were brilliant and lost. Should have been that clear. happened. Should have been clear. Should have been three 0 up before Villa even woke up. Um, and then we've done just done that against Manchester City. So what has given me that encouragement in those three defeats and one draw is that we've played the same way with the second string players. Yeah. And so, and then there's three or four players there, Lacelso being one in particular, who is clearly bought into Ange's way of thinking, and then can do something very similar to what Saar, Benton, Core, and Madison were doing previously. So, I'm more encouraged because I've seen that it's not just an eleven anymore. Yeah. Uh, I very much thought, and I, I predicted it was coming. Look, we can't keep this run going forever. Someone will get injured. Madison won't play every game. We've seen his injury record previously. It's going. The wheels are going to come off. Yeah. But even though we lost three in a row and then drew, drew at City, I don't feel like the wheels have come off. Yeah. And then now we've got Romero back on Thursday. Um, it'll be a, you know a few more weeks before we see Madison and Van de Ven again. But you know then hopefully Benton Court. And then all of a sudden, if you're then bringing on La Celso, Hoiberg, Brennan Johnson, um, and and the likes, then you start to think, hang on a minute, Spurs have got four or five attacking changes and all players who are going to do what Andy yeah. wants them to do. So yes, I think it's sustainable. We will invest again in January and bring in another centre half, hopefully, because that's required. Because there's no way Romero can go through a season without two suspensions at least, <laughs> and there's no way that Van de Ven is going to last with with dodgy hamstrings. But um, but yeah, I. I Look, I'm not pretending for a second. I'm not one of those Spurs fans who's going to say we're going to win something. I genuinely think we're top four contenders this year. Mm. And if they continue to invest in the way that they have with Madison, Porro is an outstanding footballer. Um, Destiny of Doggy is phenomenal and probably won't play for Tottenham in 12 or 18 months' time because Real Madrid or Manchester City will come knocking. Um, but um, that, that, as long as we keep investing in that sort of player... I genuinely think Ange could be the one that 
takes us back to that top table again because we're not at the top table at the moment we're not talking about cup finals and, and European runs because we didn't even qualify no, no. but I, I think he, he can take us back into that conversation again I'm not going to say that he's going to win us a try <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, look, just a couple of things before we actually get on to the game Thursday you're, you are one of the, you're the owner of one of the worst football takes that I've ever heard in my life you know what I'm going to talk to you about there uh, but before that, just very briefly, because you have touched on it already, but just give us a brief synopsis. Is it, I know all of these things aren't as black and, or aren't always black and white, there's nuance in most things. With or without Harry Kane, people are saying you're better without him. I found, now Declan Rice has gone, I feel we're better because the quality spread throughout the team. There's not too much focal point. Just briefly on Kane, what do you feel about Tottenham without him? We're absolutely not better without him. We're a better team in the way that everybody's involved, but we didn't see Poster Coglu's Tottenham with Kane and Poster Coglu's Tottenham without Kane. You think to it would be better with him? We'd be top. You reckon? Yeah, because yeah. I, I just think that at the moment, with the game against Chelsea would have been done and the red cards wouldn't have happened. Look, these are all if buts and maybes, and as I always said, a couple of injuries and, and we would lose the games. But we've, we've missed chances and we've blown points at Wolves and at home to Villa which we absolutely wouldn't have done with Harry Kane in the team. Yeah, yeah. So, look, it, it's, a, it's an if, but, and maybe. It is but one of those it's, um, weird questions. No team is better without Harry Kane in it than they yeah, are with yeah. Harry Kane. I just wonder whether he'd fit the... Do you think he'd be up to the pressing challenge? I think the best England performance of the last two years was away in Italy, yeah. when England played a real up-and-out press, press Italy. Rice was outstanding that night. And, but Saka, Foden um, and Kane as the front three and Rashford I think came on Kane played that way that night mm. Kane can do anything so oh, yeah. it doesn't really I, I, I don't buy into the um, oh it's good because we're without him the focus is off him and we're no longer the Harry Kane team as Pep put it yeah, yeah, yeah. but no team is better without him yeah well you know, I watched the England Malta game with you of course a few weeks ago and I was very again just perhaps showing the difference in our maturity levels even though we're not a million miles away in age is that you managed not to boo Harry Kane the first time you team in the flesh since he left while I, I gave actually a little, shed a little tear yeah, yeah exactly but I'll give it a little fist bump when Declan Rice is going with this and I'll there you go absolutely um, look just before we get on to the game Hume Min Son I uh, said you're the owner of the worst football take I've ever heard or one of the worst Definitely not the worst because I'm sure an Arsenal fan has got that one locked down somewhere. But uh, your your stance on Hume Son, a player who I think is world class and would have got so much more credit than he would have done if it wasn't playing in Harry Kane's shadow for so long. Now the sort of attacking talisman of Tottenham certainly in the number nine position. Now you have been saying to me for a very long time that Tottenham Hume Son only scores the third in a three one win. Uh, he scores the opener at Manchester City, and again, watching it with you, there were several, pe several, oh, the well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> several people around us immediately giving you grief, and you have sort of made that rod for your own back now, that yeah. every time human scores, oh, absolutely, yeah, you yeah. get a barrage of text. But talk to me a bit, just again, briefly, well, before we move on to the it is, it's, it, You've called it the world's worst football take. It is when it's exaggerated to that level. Which we all do. And look, every, everyone, for, for your... your watchers and listeners that I, I it gets exaggerated it's pub talk it's office talk however for two years I was very much he doesn't give us enough he doesn't finish enough chances and he doesn't take enough responsibility and Kane is always the one who digs us out of a hole and Son puts the gloss on a very nice victory yeah that was clear he did not score a winner for over a year yeah. in a football match and he scores lots of fantastic goals. He's a brilliant footballer. And that's why my frustration comes with him. Because at that level, with that amount of ability, he should have been doing more. Now, since Kane, I've got to just say he's been phenomenal. Yeah. He's been fantastic. And he's led the line. He's led the Postacoglu press. He's absolutely bought into Postacoglu. And by the way, when a new manager comes in, if, if a senior pro like John Minson doesn't buy into it, Half the dressing room doesn't buy into yeah, it. Yeah. So he has to lead that, and he has done. However, there's still this big chances in big games thing. We, we should win against Villa. And he's three goals to Salah for offside. He's got to be better than that. Yeah. You, can't, you, you, know, you can get away with one, you can't get away with three. 
Um, but he's just still electric. And look, yeah, it gets exaggerated. Everyone thinks I dislike him. I love him, but I want more from him. Yeah. And this season he's delivering more and he hopefully will get 20, 20 league goals and we'll finish fourth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I've done that hopefully, but yeah. <laughs> right, talk to you then, uh, Dino, because obviously it's more about what's going on at Tottenham holistically, which is why we've covered most of that so far. The game on Thursday night, I've, we've had a brief chat before and I've just got one of those feelings where yeah, I, I still do look forward to Tottenham games and I love the Tottenham games and they've thrown up some absolute doozies in the last few years haven't they? Well like, the last 15 years. Well yeah. exactly yeah yeah but you know seven six seven goal thrillers on the reg last minute winners for either team um, or just the odd one nil and players who certainly from a West Ham perspective made themselves cult heroes almost just off the strength of you know, one close goals game. Exactly, yeah, no one has any. Or, you know, even you go a bit further back, Paul Stout Terry, of course, for Spurs, yep. that infamous game. Um, Gareth so, Bale's turning point, many people think as well. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. a couple of boys who scored twice, yeah, two twice, really yeah, goals yeah. up to part, didn't he? Um, but I just, you know, what I sort of, the way I look at Tottenham games, there seems to be a pattern, right? We, there's either, they're either one ugly, one nil by a team, by either team, and they're forgettable, and yep. you never remember them. Remember Eric, Eric Lamella, Eric Lamella's Eric header Lamella. at the London Stadium a couple of years ago. Horrible Can't game, little game. flicked header, and that was the only time yeah. either team went inside the box, I think. Eric Dyer game. scored one at Upton yeah, Park. Yeah, last game at Upton Park. Uh, Pochettino's first game, I think, Eric Dyer was playing right back. Like, mm, yeah, little somehow overlapping found run. himself yeah, in the yeah, video, yeah. yeah. Um, and a couple of ones, you know, cold though, but then you've got the Ravel Morrison game, the main one, that's easy one, obviously the two Gareth Bale games, the yeah. League Cup one, Andre Ayew. Unbelievable game. We come back yeah. from three, two, some real humdingers. And then, mixed in with all that, you'll give us a slapping. Every once, every six or seven games. And I've just, as we've spoke about the general feeling going into the game, I've just got a horrible feeling, although we don't tend to get slapped under David Moyes, that Thursday's going to be one of those... Get, we get humped games. Yeah. What, how are you feeling about it? I, I, I'm, I never really know which West Ham's gonna gonna arrive, which is which is a little bit what you've alluded to there. Um, a little bit more consistent under Moyes, obviously, but it's also a. I, I think part of the problem with the London derbies is that is how many of those players actually buy into the club rivalry. I mean, yeah. Spurs, Spurs, if Oliver Skip doesn't play, you know, Harry Kane's gone, Harry Winks has gone. The, Noble's the, yeah, been the, there, yeah, yeah, Noble's not West Ham, you know, and you haven't got that many lads who are, who are it's like, it's part of, it's part of them to, yeah. to be right on edge. You know, the, the old Chelsea Tottenham battle of the bridge and all the spiteful clashes were, were mainly because there were some pretty horrible human beings <laughs> in both those teams who just wanted to kick lumps out of each other. Yeah, yeah. It had nothing to do with Chelsea Tottenham other yeah. than there was a big game at the end of the season. Yeah. Um, but I don't think there's that edge which probably doesn't do West Ham any favours because mm. it, 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 it'll be pretty unlikely, I think, that you turn it into a, into a scrap, yeah. you know, and which you have done in the past. I, I think if, if Spurs are anything like they were against Manchester City or anything like they were against Aston Villa, we'll win. Mm. Um, but with the number of injuries that we've had and the number of actual first-team selections who aren't available, there's always going to be this question mark of how long can the second string keep up that intensity, yep. especially enough. on the back of the second half of the Etihad. Yeah. So, yeah, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to... Now my colours to say we're, we're, we're definitely going to win, but to go back to Son, Kulicheski, Basuma, Romero being back, and the two full-backs of Doggy and Porro, um, we've got enough quality to win. Brennan Johnson is yeah. really... I, I thought that was a weird signing. Yeah. But he's actually slowly growing into it. He's, the quickest, a a he's the quickest player we've had since Carl Walker and Aaron Lennon left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he's genuinely, when you see him live... He's genuinely one of those players you go, wow, I didn't realise he was that fast. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, because the Premier League is so quick, every player is quick, yeah, yeah. apart from maybe Eric Dyer. But, um, but, but genuinely, he is electric. Um, and there, there was a moment where um, the Aston Villa fullback was caught the wrong side. And before he even turned his head, Johnson was in behind. Yeah. And, and he, in a Postacoglu setup where every 
three or four minutes you win the ball back high upfield and then it can be two passes and someone's in behind he's a real asset real yeah, asset. yeah. I, it, it seems futile I normally ask the opposition view what do you, how do you think the game's going to go style wise that seems futile to ask you that because we know what we're going to get from, from Tottenham I can just see it being when I said humping I, I think I can just see it being David Moyes his record away at the you know big six club I hate that phrase but the big six clubs is poor it's terrible Mm. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's something like it's less than five wins in forty-five or something crazy. Yeah. Um, and I can just see it. He West Ham set up to contain, and we finish the go- the game losing probably three nil, two or three nil, having had thirty percent possession and zero shots on target. Where just the whole game, you're just like, what's the point? Like we just come to. I think you'll have shots on target because Tottenham give up those chances. Not not because they're trying to give them up, but because they're trying to play themselves into a position from being in a position that they don't really want the ball. And for, for, for the West Ham fans who understandably maybe haven't seen a lot of Spurs this season, they I think they'll be shocked at some of the areas that Tottenham try and play football in mm. and with someone as quick as Bowen and as tenacious as Bowen yeah. there, there will be some moments where you nick the ball and if you can be and that, I'm sure that's what Moyes will be saying to them if you can be clinical in those moments like the Haaland two missed chances that Haaland had on, on at the Etihad on Sunday um, then there's you know there will be opportunities for West Ham but, but West Ham will just will let you play with the ball in your heart up to the halfway line we'll go whatever lads if they do that they're going to have problems well that, that that's I think what will happen because it will be yeah you do all that there we don't care and and then if we do end up winning the ball back wherever that might be there's so much of the pitch to cover yeah. normally Bowen trying to do it on his own maybe with Kudus floating yeah. around him um, but listen, Dean, it's been great having you on the We Are West Ham podcast for the first time. Ahead of Thursday's game in the Premier League, West Ham v Spurs at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. I still don't know why we're not allowed to call it the new White Hart Lane, but that's a conversation for another day. I know you're going. Uh, I'm not sure. I can't really face it this week. I don't think I've got to go out for a meal for my sister's birthday. Tell me, what is the score going to be? I'm going to go 3-1 Spurs. 3-1 Spurs. We can't keep a clean sheet for love nor money. I just can't see a scoring and I can see it being one of them underwhelming ones. So I'm going to say 2-0 to Tottenham West Ham of less than 35% position. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you will. Sure you will. <laughs> but listen, thanks very much for watching, everyone. Thanks to Dean for coming on, Deputy Head of Sun Sport and big Tottenham Hotspur fan. And just remember that when Hugh Min Son scores the first, second and probably third goals on Thursday, the Dino said he only scores the third in three nil wins for Tottenham. Thanks very much for listening. Bit of a packed week this week. We've got Fulham on Sundays. The Opposition View will be with you as a separate video and podcast a little bit later on in the week and this will of course if you're listening it'll be part of the podcast with Jonesy if you're watching on YouTube it'll be a standalone thanks for listening as always subscribe like follow you know the usual places to go and we'll speak to you later this week